Okay, uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing an award-winning sports writer and radio host who is also a best-selling author, and I was just telling him the story about how every book that he writes makes me cry. I cry in, in every single one of them. He first gained fame as a sports writer for the Detroit Free Press and is the most decorated winner of the Associated Press Sports Editor Co Editors Contest. He's inspired millions of readers with his books, for one more day, the five people you meet in heaven. Did anybody cry while reading that one? Probably. Tuesdays with Maury. Yes. The most successful memoir ever ever published, I should add, and which is a record of the life lessons learned from a mentor who fought his own battle against ALS. Now this busy author is slated to write the foreword for a new book by T.R. Pearson, due out by the end of the year and titled Augie's Quest. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mitch Album. Thank you. I had a teacher once. He was the best teacher I ever had. His name was Maury Schwartz. He stood about, oh, yay high. He had silver hair, green eyes, a crooked tooth smile, and a wonderful way of making you feel like you were the first student he'd ever taught. I still remember the first day I met him. It was my first day of classes in 1975 at Brandeis University. It was introduction to sociology, which is what he taught. I walked into the classroom, and there were nine kids in the class. Being a typical freshman, I immediately sized up the situation and said, no, 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 this is much too small a class. If I cut it, they'll know I'm not here. So I was actually turning around and heading for the registrar's office to drop the class when he began to call roll. And one of the problems when your last name begins with A, can't get out fast enough. And so he said, Mitchell album, and I kind of slid back in guilty, and I said, here. And he said, is it Mitch or Mitchell? Which do you prefer? Now, I don't know that doesn't mean anything to you, but for me, I was kind of touched because I have one of those names that depending on what year you go to school, it's Mitch or Mitchy or Mitchell or something. So I said, well, Mitch, my friends call me Mitch. And he said, all right, Mitch it is then. And Mitch? And I said, yeah. He said, I hope one day you'll think of me as your friend. So I knew cutting the class was out of the question at that point. But that began this really remarkable friendship that I had with Maury that spanned all four years of college. I took every class he offered. I ended up majoring in sociology, not because I was very interested in it, but because it would have been a shame to waste all those credits. By the time graduation came, I went to go see him for one last time, and I bought him a briefcase. I didn't have any money back then. It had to be the world's cheapest briefcase, but it had his initials on it, and I gave it to them. And he looked at it, and he turned it around, and he began to cry a little bit, and he gave me a big hug. And he said, Mitch, you're one of the good ones. Promise me you'll stay in touch. All right, I said, I will. Promise. Okay, I promise. Say it in a sentence. <laughs> All right, Maury. I promise I'll stay in touch. I promise I'll stay in touch. And then I graduated went off into the world to do all those nice things you heard in that introduction. And I proceeded to break that promise every day, every week, every month, and every year for 16 years. 16 years without even a phone call. Maury, during that time, continued to touch people the way he always had, went very happily and contentedly through his 50s, 60s, and 70s. And in his 70s, he began to notice a change in his body. Long walks would leave him tired. Eh, I'm getting old, he say. Then he began to stumble inexplicably, get out of a car and trip over the curb. One day he was out on the dance floor and he just fell over, just onto the floor. And as he would later say to me, Mitch, I never fell when I danced. And so we began that process that we have of trying to find out what's wrong with him in one test and a CAT scan and an MRI and a doctor and a specialist and another. Eight long months until one day he sat across from a Boston neurologist 
who said to him, Maury, I have some bad news. You have Lou Gehrig's disease. Maury thought back to his youth. He'd grown up in New York. Lou Gehrig's disease, he said. That's fatal. Yeah, the doctor said it is. Well, it used to be fatal, right? They have a cure for it now, right? No, the doctor said there's no cure. Well, how long do I have left to live? Maury asked. Hard to say, the doctor said. Maybe a couple years. Well, Maury left that office, walked outside to a beautiful summer day, and he saw the sky, and he saw people riding bicycles, and he saw people laughing, and a voice inside of him said, Hey! Hey! What's going on? Don't you all know what just happened to me in there? Isn't the whole world supposed to stop now? No more laughter, no more bicycles, no more blue skies. Everything's supposed to go gray. People should come running up to me because I got this bad news. And he waited for that to happen. But it didn't happen. Because the world cannot cater to one individual. And so on the steps of that building, my old teacher made a very profound decision. He could either go this way and be angry all the rest of his days, or he could go this way and try to find something positive in this terribly negative hand that he had been dealt. And like our guest of honor tonight, he chose. And he decided he would teach about what it was like to die right up until the day he died. He taught, he invited people in to see him as his body changed, as he lost the ability to walk, as he lost the ability to pull up his own pants, buckle his own belt, brush his own teeth, even wipe his own rear end. Throughout the whole process, he taught. He invited people in. Talk to me, he said. Ask me questions. What do you want to know? Pay no attention to this body. That's not me. That's the carton I was shipped in. I'm still here. Look in my eyes. I'm still here. He wrote down aphorisms, expressions that he had, things that he was learning. A reporter got a hold of it, came out and did a story about this strange old man teaching his last class. That story found its way down to the desk of one Ted Koppel, the host of Nightline. And the next thing you know, Nightline was doing the first of three specials on Maury Schwartz. The first of which ran on a Friday night. And a thousand miles away, in my very comfortable home, in my very comfortable suburb, on my very large TV screen, I was doing the great American male tradition. When I came upon the Nightline program and did a double take, because there on the screen was a thin, white-haired, sickly-looking version of my old professor. And it was only through that chance flipping that I found out this man, who I had cared about so many years earlier, only had a few months left to live. Well, I went and saw him on what was supposed to be a one-time visit. I figured I'd just drop in, stay a half an hour, give him my best, and disappear. I watched as we sat at his table together, him try to eat a piece of tomato, lift it up to his mouth, see it fall off the fork. Lift it up to his mouth again, see it fall off. Finally get it in his mouth and take a long time to chew it. He never complained. All he talked about was what he was learning, how new doors were opening up to him, how people were treating him and things he was discovering about life. And by the end of what happened to be and ended up being a long day and night, I flew home on the plane and I said to myself, you know, you're 37 years old and you're perfectly healthy. And he's 78 years old and has a terminal illness. And yet he seems 10 times happier and more content with his life than you are. What's the matter with this picture? And I began to go back. Another Tuesday, another Tuesday, Another, 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 and all the Tuesdays that Maury had left in his life to try to find out what he knew that I did not. 
And what I discovered in those Tuesdays was that just as Maury had once taught me, ALS was teaching Maury. It taught him about the value of touch, for example. Whenever I would visit Maury, he always wanted me to hold his hand, rub his feet. I used to put this little microphone on to tape our conversations, but he always wore these pajama tops. And so whenever I would put this little mic on, after about three minutes, it would flop over, and I'd have to lean in really close to fix it. And every time I got close, it was like kissing him on the cheek, and he'd always get this really big smile. And I said, I think you wear these pajamas, so I have to kiss you every five minutes. He said, maybe. <laughs> and I asked him once, Maury, you can hardly feel anything. Why is it so important that I hold your hand? all the time, rub your feet, touch you. Why is physical touch so important? And he said, well, Mitch, think when you're a baby and you're coming into the world, what's the one most important thing? You need to be held, touched, caressed, comforted, right? Well, I'll let you in on a secret. When you're leaving the world, you also need to be held, touched, caressed, comforted. There's no mystery in that for me, he said. The mystery for me is why in between the coming and the going, we act like we don't need it. ALS taught him about touch. It taught him about compassion for strangers. We sat once and watched television. There was a war going on. I can't even remember which particular conflict. And they showed some footage of some people and soldiers and people being wounded. And Maury began to cry, just cry. And I said, why are you crying? He said, it's so terrible. I said, well, yes, war is always terrible, but you don't know those people. You've never been to that country. I'm not sure you could even find it on a map. And he said to me, Mitch, what this disease has taught me is when you're really facing your own mortality, you have endless compassion for other people who are doing the same. And you suddenly find that anyone suffering anywhere is like a brother to you. We are all more alike than different, he said. And you realize that the closer you get to the end. It taught him about giving. Giving while you're here tonight. I used to go into Maury... And on Tuesdays, once in a while, other people would come and visit. And it was interesting to me because they would always follow a similar pattern. These were people who just knew Maury casually, wanted to come by once, and they weren't very comfortable with sick people, and they always had a strategy. You know, it was always, I'm going to tell them funny stories, I'm going to cheer them up, I'm not going to say anything downbeat, I'm upbeat, upbeat, upbeat. And they would wait outside, and the door would open to his office, and they would go in, and the door would close, and they'd come out an hour later in tears. But they'd be crying about their divorce, their job, their salary. And I watched this happen so many times. And I said, what happened? And they said, I don't know. I went in, I tried to cheer him up. But then after about five minutes, he started asking me about my problems. And I started talking. And then he started really asking me. I started really talking. And then the next thing I know, I'm really telling him everything. And I'm crying. And he said, I went in to try to comfort him. And I ended up being comforted by him. And finally, I went into Maury one Tuesday. I said, I don't get it. If ever anyone had finally earned the right to say that sentence, let's not talk about your problems. Let's talk about my problems. It would be you. If ever anyone had really earned the right to say, you think you got it bad, you've hit the mother load of sympathy here, Maury. Why don't you take advantage of it? And he looked at me as if I would just stepped out of a spaceship. And he said, Mitch, why would I ever take like that? Taking from people just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. It is a profound little sentence. It also rhymes, so it's easy to remember. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And you know it's true because you know the opposite is false. Taking never makes you feel alive. 
oh, it's the basis of consumerism and materialism and capitalism and everything, and we take all these things and we think we're going to live forever. But think about it. Think about the movies you've seen where there's a patriarch in the family and he's dying and everybody gathers around to hear his final words. What's he going to say? What's he going to say? They lean in. What's he going to say with his final sentence? Does he ever, in any movie you've ever seen, with his final breath, ever utter a sentence like, bring me the big screen television sets. I just want to touch it one more time. No. You laugh because it's preposterous. But now think about that real moment that all of us are going to face. In that final moment, all that you own is of no use to you. All that you purchased and acquired brings you no comfort. It's probably not even in the room with you. It's in the garage. It's in the summer house. It's in the bank vault. If in that final drop of sand through the hourglass, all that matters is the people that you love are there with you, holding your hand, and you can look them in the eye and tell them how you feel about them, then what makes you think that in all the other drops of sand through the hourglass, that's not the most important thing, too? What do they teach us in high school about grains of sand on the beach? Millions of them can't tell one from the other, right? And the one that is dropping through your hourglass now, as you're listening to me, is the same as the one that's going to drop with your last breath. And what's going to be important in that last one is what's important now. We just don't believe it because we all think we got endless sand. ALS taught Maury that you don't have endless sand. And the way that you feel alive is by giving. And tonight, you're going to be asked to either give or think about giving. And remember, this is the way you bring yourself to life. The last day I visited Maury is the last thing I want to share with you. He was very weak by this point. You had to lean in very close to hear him, kind of like these microphones. And I leaned in, and he said to me, I have a favor to ask. Anything, I said. After I die, he said, I want you to visit me at my grave. All right, I said. I was going to do that anyhow. Not the way other people do it. Leave the car engine running, put some flowers down, get back in the car, go away. I want you to come when you have some time. Bring a blanket. Bring some sandwiches. Plan on sticking around for a while. And I want you to talk to me about your life, about your problems. And I said, wait a minute. You want me to come to a cemetery, have a picnic at your tombstone, and talk to the air? Exactly, he said. Just like we're talking now. I said, well, Maury, let's face it, it's not going to be like we're talking now because you're not going to be able to talk back. And he looked at me as if I were being very naive. And he said, well, Mitch, I'll make you a deal. After I'm gone, you talk, I'll listen. Yeah. I, yeah. I laughed a little, too. But when I sat down in the basement to write this little book, Tuesdays with Maury, to try to pay Maury's medical expenses. I kept coming back to that last sentence. You talk, I'll listen. And I realized it was not an accident that Maury waited until the end to share that with me because that was the essence of everything he tried to teach me, the essence of everything he had learned with ALS, the essence of everything I'm trying to say to you tonight, and the essence of why you are here and why Augie is doing what he's doing. And that is simply this. If you lead your life with people, making time for people, giving of yourself with people, sharing with people, 
helping people with their problems, then when you're gone, you are not 100% gone. You live on inside the heads and hearts of everyone you touch. And they can talk to you, not because they believe in ghosts or seances or things like that, but because you spend time putting yourself inside them. Your voice is inside them. The memories are inside them. It's like a penny in a piggy bank. You know, when you take a penny and you put it in a piggy bank, for all intents and purposes, it's gone, right? You can't see it, so it's gone. But you take the bank and you shake it. And there it is, always there. The sound, the voice. One life touches another, touches another. And this is how what Maury said, death ends a life, but not a relationship. The relationship goes on if you have invested in it while you're here. And if you don't think that that's true, or you think that's just a corny way for a corny speaker to wrap up a corny little talk, then look around. Why are you here? Why are you here tonight? Why are you listening to me? You don't know me. You didn't know Maury. He wasn't rich, he wasn't famous was a nice old man who took time in his life, in his dying days, to teach and share some of what he was going through with one of his students. And I wrote a book to try to help him pay his medical bills. And somebody read it and passed it on and passed it on and passed it on. And now look how large his classroom has grown for a man who's not even here to teach it. Maury never read a single word of the book Tuesdays with Maury. But look how many people he's touched, including one very handsome, strong man who happened to read the book and knew somebody who knew somebody who knew me and said, gee, if I could ever get a copy of that book signed by him, that would be nice. And that person came to me and told me about this man who was doing more sick than a hundred people do healthy. Would I sign a book for this man? And I said, tell me where he lives and I will bring it to him. And I did. And I, on that day, got to share in what most of you who have already experienced, the joy of meeting Augie and Lynn Nieto. And from then, we've become friends. One life touches another, touches another. And all of you have the ability, through your contributions, through your efforts, and through your friendship, to touch many, many people around the world, those who need it most. I'm going to end with a joke that Maury always told me Part of the joke was the fact that he told it to me every time I came there, even though he said, you'll love this one. <laughs> there are two waves in the ocean. They're flopping around, a he wave and a she wave. They're flopping, they're flopping, and all of a sudden, the he wave starts to panic because it sees the shore. What's the matter, the she wave says. Look! The heat wave says, we only got a couple more flips and then we're going to hit the shore and then we're going to disappear. This is terrible. I mean, a couple more flips and then we're nothing. Aren't you worried? This is awful. And the she wave calmly says to the heat wave, you don't understand. You're not a wave. You're part of the ocean. And then Moria would say, you get it? Part of the ocean. And I would say, I got it last week, and the week before, and the week before. Tonight, you are all part of the ocean, and you are being moved in this big pool of humanity by a very large, very powerful, very charismatic, and very, very, very important, significant wave. Will you please say hello to our guests of honor here tonight, Augie and Lynn Nieto. Yeah. Stop believing Hold on to that feeling yeah. Streetlights People oh. Don't stop believing oh. Streetlights People oh. Don't stop 
<laughs> oh man, we going to party. <laughs> Two years ago, yesterday, I was given my diagnosis at the Mayo Clinic. <clears throat> what? I thought was a death sentence was permission to live. You cannot control what happens to you. You can control how you respond. I've been given the clarity of thought as my muscles are failing me. It's like a blind man who can hear better. I have more focus, more insight than I've ever had in my life. It's one of the gifts, this horrible, wonderful disease has given me. I worked 30 years hoping to be on the front cover of the Wall Street Journal, and it was not until I got ALS and decided to change the way research was currently being done that I got the coveted dot drawing. I have had the opportunity to speak to numerous, numerous people with ALS. Up until our quest, you were not allowed to use the word cure with ALS. There is such a great feeling when you turn despair into hope and hope into joy. With your help, we will find a cure. I've had the opportunity to meet wonderful people like Luke Christie, the National MDA Goodwill Ambassador, the young man on the cover of Parade with me. When I first met him, all I could see was his wheelchair. Once I had the privilege of calling him my brother from another mother, <laughs> all I could see was Luke and the chair disappearing. Lynn and I received a letter from a teacher in sixth grade class in Mississippi. It reads, and they put it big enough so I can actually see it without my glasses. Dear Augie, we learned about your diagnosis from Parade Magazine and decided to join your quest. We hosted a holiday festival. 
Each student made items to sell to the rest of the school. We sold tickets prior to the event with the motto, Bo Mars team is going to bat out, is going to bat to strike out ALS. I included a poster of a picture of Maury Schwartz, Lou Gehrig, a close friend of mine who lost his battle with ALS, and a picture of Augie, and the urgent plea to find a cure for him. I first learned about ALS by reading Tuesdays with Maury. I use it as part of a character education program I have initiated with sixth grade students. A friend of mine from my hometown was taken with ALS in August of 2004. I visited him weekly the last few months of his life. My students and I are passionate about your cause. Please accept our contribution of $4,632.37. And know that a small group of Mississippi students And know that a small group of Mississippi students are pulling for you and praying for a cure. Sincerely, Millie Wolf, Gifted Education, Bomar Elementary School, Mississippi. We have had the opportunity and the pleasure of hearing things hearing words spoken to us that most people would never hear because otherwise they would have waited till your memorial to say them about you. We received an email a couple of days after my diagnosis. From a good friend of ours, Chris Klassen. If I can get through this, I will. It read, it was literally the day after we sent out the email about our diagnosis. It read this. They might call it Lou Gehrig's disease, but they'll call it Aguinaldo's cure. Tonight's a celebration about living, and we're happy to share it with you. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, we're done. <laughs> All right, good. Okay. No. Thank you. Huh? Mm. This is why we're here, you guys. Thank you. Incredible. Thanks, you guys. Um, wow. <clears throat> I think we all need to take that in for a second, don't we? 